It's been decades since a Formula 1 car's suspension was just for vehicle dynamics. The mid-90s was when the aerodynamic effects of the suspension became apparent. Most of the solutions seemed to decrease the drag by reducing its frontal area. Tyrrell in 1996 with Mark Gascoigne and Harvey Postlethwaite did the most dramatic thing, making the entire top wishbone area a filled-in surface. In Formula 1's greatest tradition, it was swiftly banned. However, this was just the beginning of the suspension's aerodynamic role, beyond just vehicle dynamics. Attempts were made to accommodate suspension layouts, but compromised suspension geometry due to the high noses were then the norm. This gave rise to alternative kinematic solutions, which included outboard instantaneous sensors. The current generation of car follows this trend of compromised suspension geometry. Due to all the front wing elements being attached to the nose, the suspension position in the airstream may be more important than ever, rather than just the chassis mounting point. So it is in this video I gave myself the opportunity to understand how important the suspension aerodynamics is for this generation of cars. Clues to the importance comes from the decision of Red Bull to run pull rod suspension. Not a decision they would have taken lightly. Even Mercedes went to the trouble in moving the upper front mounting point with something resembling a strap brace in a big mid-season update. The other comes from my very basic CFD experiments to understand these cars. Each time I added improvements to the front wing, everything downstream became worse, including the rear wing with a reduction of 15% in downforce. This coupled with a dysfunctional profile that had all the separation, such that after the profiles ended, the surface streams flow up the chassis. Uh, looking at the streamlines after the profiles were fixed, the chassis around the suspension arms show a stark difference. Previously over the profiles themselves, signs of detachment were pretty obvious. In contrast with the refined profile, the air is attached, with only small bits of local detachment. The change to the profile causing this consisted of an upper surface being curved and the lower almost flat. Another change included an angle of attack downwards towards the front wing. The arm positions haven't changed except the swap from pushrod to a pullrod suspension, which makes more sense. The pushrod will pull air in, whereas the pullrod arm will pull air out. It shouldn't be a surprise that there was a reduction in downforce due to the curvature surface profile required to counter the upwash of the front wing. The surprise was the amount. In this case, it resulted in a significant amount of lift on the chassis, which includes the floor. In the two initial cases I tested, which became three, with two different front wings previously ran, that is the outboard loaded and the inboard loaded type, it shifted the center of pressure back 15 to 17 millimeters, or removed 20 to 24% of the front axle's contribution to the downforce, corresponding in a 4.8 to 5.6% shift in the aero balance rearwards. The centerline plot shows how much pressure under the chassis has increased. The direct comparison is the red and black lines, as these have the same front wing. Despite removing significant amount of downforce from the front, the overall downforce for the body doesn't change. Adding another result, the red becomes purple plot suggests that the floor should be far more effective, but this may have been a result of a meshing issue. With the issues mounting with this model, and the addition of a gurney flap on the rear wing, the unexpected and non-corresponding low body downforce value I reluctantly ran another simulation. This gave the expected numbers and this red plot. The vorticity animation shows that there is a clear difference around the front of the chassis. Also the animation corresponding to the red and purple plot has a flow structure that is far more coherent than I have seen on this model. Going back to the start and stopping just at the end of the last suspension arm, the flow up over the front suspension is now lower as a result of the change. This continues back with the vorticity present, and isn't higher than the chassis as the floor starts. After the start of the floor fences, the outwash caused by the chassis, floor, and side point interactions is more prominent with the change. This continues right up and past where the floor fences end. If we stop here, underneath the edge of the side port has a little bit more rotation. I think I like the look of the baseline flow structure, specifically here, in the undercut. But if the latest models was to look like this, with the same apparent increase in rotational energy, that would be better. 
the extra rotation continues back and is now noticeable here. The upward loaded front wing is about the same. The cockpit weight seems to now have more losses, but it's actually lower vorticity, therefore lower pressure gradients, which makes sense as the air impacting the cockpit is now cleaner. Any lack of coherent aerodynamics around this area is less likely hidden and will have a more direct impact on the rear wing. The question is, will the rear wing work better because the suspension deflects the front wing weight down? The answer is yes, otherwise this video wouldn't exist. The hypothesis formed because I haven't modified the rear wing since I began exploring these cars aero. That is, each positive modification to the front wing affected the rear wing negatively, overall about 15% of downforce. The way the air detaches from the second element seems to be a problem. The aim was to see if the suspension could re-establish the second element's function. With that in mind, I added a gurney foot on the trailing edge. Also, just to confuse myself further, I removed the rear axle rather than just covering it with a profile. The result was I was able to get back 11.5% of the 15% lost. But this added gurney was a bit of a mistake because the coefficient of pressure plot didn't show enough difference to indicate whether the front suspension change helped the rear wing. I was expecting there would be enough of a pressure drop over the leading edge to correspond to a higher coefficient of lift of the wing. The problem is that I also removed the rear drive axle, improving the beam wing, which may explain all the change in coefficient of lift. To give specific evidence for the required front suspension change positively affecting the rear wing, I needed to run an extra simulation without the gurney flap. So a couple of days later, the main plane has a specific coefficient of pressure profile that indicates the suspension change affected the rear wing in a positive way. That is, the gurney alone is worth 3.5% and the other 6.5% is a combination of the front suspension and rear axle removal. The kicker that justified this extra simulation was the coefficient of pressure plots along the profile of the rear wing's main and second element. Comparing like for like, it is obvious. Higher pressure on the upper side of both elements, particularly along the center line, translates to high energy air. The beam wing plots in the three places along the profile showed a significant difference, about 8% on the second element's underside. The surface area difference for the beam wing and the main wing suggests that maybe about 1 to 2 of the 6.5% improvement of the rear wing could be from the beam. Then finally, considering the coupling of the floor and beam wing, in this case the extra floor performance, the 1.8%, is likely found here, or at least some of it is.